this is going to be my uh, research update presentation on working on the new neural network for our Spaceworks Orbital Prime uh, program with Taiwan Aerospace. So, as usual, from statement, and I'm going to go briefly on touch on what we have worked on so far in this topic, um, and then I'll talk about the goals and methods uh, plan and slash implemented for SKMV3, some preliminary experiments and results with conclusion. So motivation-wise, we all know why we do this. Um, basically, sustain sustainability on Earth orbit and beyond. Um, we want to maintain a clean environment free of any collision hazards and so forth. And to do so, there are multiple ways you can deal with these uh, potentially unoperative um, objects in Earth orbit, either by going there and trying to refuel it, you know, giving it prolonged life service, or also, if it's a trash, then we just collect it and get rid of it from our orbit. All of these requires precise navigation capability about the target, preferably autonomously, so that it can serve as multiple targets, maybe in one mission, and so forth. And we want to use our a vision-based system, such as camera, because of its low cost, uh, low swap C. So the problem statement so far that we've been working on is using a monocular camera of a servicer to determine the pose, that is position and orientation, of a non corporate target relative to the servicer's camera from a single or a sequence of images. So far, we've worked, uh, focused mainly on known targets. So we assume that we have 3D model of the target available a priori to the mission, which it makes sense for certain mission types like servicing or if we have like specific clients that we know. But we have also started working on expanding this to unknown targets. So in this case, um, using from a singular sequence of images, not only do we want to recover the pose associated with each of these images, but also using that, try to reconstruct the 3D model slash properties of the target. That includes not only its um, shape, but also potentially you know, its principal moment of inertia, to characterize its rotational motion, and so forth. So what we have done so far in this topic so obviously, first start with creating a database because this is a computer vision problem for which machine learning is an excellent tool. But to train that model we want, we need a lot of data. Uh, so we could generate a lot of data from synthetic renderers such as OpenGL. And recently, we're also working on the Unreal Engine-based um, si um, simulator as well. But to validate its performance in space without actually having access to space, uh, we need some very high fidelity simulator um, physically made on ground. So that was the purpose of the Tron facility. And from this, we have actually came up with uh, two data sets that are publicly available. One is Speed Plus, um, which includes not only synthetic images, but also live box and solid images of the target mock-up model um, with the albedo and direct sunlight um, simulated, respectively. The other data set is called SHIRT for satellite hardware in the loop rendezvous trajectory. Um, and this basically consists of two rendezvous trajectories that are both realized in synthetic and real world Tron. Um, so this can be used to basically test your um, machine learning included Kalman filter or navigation filter and try to see how that filter as a whole can adapt to a domain gap uh, between the synthetic images used for training and the, the light box images here from Tron. So for these data sets, we have, um, there are two contributions. One was a neural network model that is made robust um, just by training on synthetic images. So a lot of focus on bridging the domain gap between synthetic and real world uh, spacecraft images. Um, and the SPMV2, basically two things we learned was that having it do multitask learning, so having you know, learn on not only post-related uh, tasks, but also unrelated tasks such as uh, segmentation, helps uh, bridge that domain gap, and also with a lot of uh, extensive data allocation. Now, what we've also tried was um, what we call online domain refinement, or ODR, which is basically, the idea is that you want to use these space images that you get during the rendezvous to additionally refine your um, CNN, so the motivation is that, yes, Tron images are great for us to do um, extensive analysis on the domain gap, but still the best resource for bridging the domain gap is the image that we get on space. So 
from a sequence of like streams of images that we see from the target during the rendezvous, maybe we can additionally refine um, our, our CNN. And that's basically what um, this did, was basically using the segmentation um, task to uh, do self-supervised learning. Um, two, adaptively tuned only a very fraction of a neural network's weights, less than 1% of it, which have in actually led to an increase in performance overall in speed plus. We've also used SPMV2 as a measurement source within a navigation filter of on the camel filter. And you know, tested it on shirt, and we also we could also see that despite that domain gap and performance degradation when tested on the white box images, we could still have the filter um, you know, converge to stable, uh, steady state. Now, that was so far mostly an unknown target, but now moving on to the unknown target, there is a question of how you can use leverage machine learning to train um, the machine learning models to reconstruct 3D models. And there are really, on top of the operation time for computational speed requirement on the neural network, there is now also a requirement or more of a constraint on the size of the data set that you need. And by the size, I mean the number of different 3D models of the satellite. You know, for the for the neural network to learn, to generalize across these different potential configurations of the satellite shapes. So with these two constraints in mind, on one end, we have worked on representing the satellite's 3D shape as an assembly of very primitive, simplified geometries. And for that, we can actually do it from single images. Um, obviously, given that you have very good view of the, of the target well, from this single image. To train this, however, we need a very large data set because this is being trained offline. But in terms of the operation time um, during rendezvous, this is actually very efficient because this requires only one single forward pass of a neural network. Uh, on the other end of the spectrum, we have uh, what Paul is working on using the NERF or neural radiance field. Basically, NERF requires you to take a bunch of images at the scene, and it is training a, what is called a radiance field. So basically, the input of this NERF is the position and viewpoint of the camera, and the output of this is basically the render scene um, at that viewpoint. And this could be, this has been in literature uh, used for not only pose estimation, but also, you know, uh, included into the SLAM framework and so forth. So it is an active, uh, you know, field of research. Now, of course, what that means is that we don't need that large data set um, to train this off offline, because this is going to be trained online um, at the scene, so we don't really need that big data set. However, because we're training this, on, training this online, this does require collecting a lot of images and also the training resource and time during rendezvous. So that's on the other side of it. So we're both um, pursuing these two very different approaches with very different constraints to see how things go. Because at this point, we still don't know what it really looks like in terms of how to do this 3D reconstruction slash post estimation slash navigation about the unknown target instance. So with that, I would like, like to move on to SPNV3, which is going to be the next uh, generation neural network for known target um, pose estimation. And this is going to be more of a, um, there's a lot of different parts in it, um, some theoretical parts, some more application side. The focus of this is going to be more on the application side of it. So. What we want to achieve with SPMV3 is that, first of all, it is developed within the context of the SpaceWorks Orbital Prime with Taiwan Aerospace. And within that, there are a couple things that we want this SPMV3 to achieve. One is that it works on the maximal range of intersatellite light distance. So what that means is we, as soon as the image, the target satellite becomes somewhat result that we can you know, approximately do close estimation, that's, the, that's where we want to start doing this all the way to the vacuum range. Second is that it obviously needs to work on satellite avionics, which is something that we have uh, stressed multiple times but never actually got to work on. 
Um, so what this means is that this needs to be small and computationally efficient. And that, re that constraint is imposed not only on just the inference, so like making predictions, but also on the training as well for the potential opportunity of refining the neural network weights online using the space point images. Um, third is that, so yeah, yeah, that's what I just talked about, the online training. So to briefly talk about why SPMV2 cannot achieve these goals. So to first, in terms of working on the full range of distance for resolved target, basically, we're considering a scenario where we are approaching this target from very far, and we're using star trackers to do all angles only navigation, uh, which is Justin's work. And then there is that kind of gray area where, you know, neither uh, angles only navigation or pose estimation using molecular camera may not be a good fit uh, because for star tracker, you know, because of the exposure and all that, with, as the target gets closer, um, there may be a may become a problem with the centering algorithm to, you know, pinpoint what exactly the target is or like the target's position is. But for post estimation using a monitor camera, the target still might be too far to have resolved image. So that gray area is something that Justin and I are working on. But as soon as that we get out of that gray area, that's where we want to start doing post estimation. And using Tango spacecraft from Prisma mission as an example, that's about 50 meters, uh, maybe a little more, but that's basically where we want to begin. Now, why can SP1 can SP uh, SPMV2 not do it? Is because that neural network was developed specifically for Speed Plus, and the inner satellite distance for Speed Plus was limited by the size of the Tron facility and also the scale of the model, which means for all those images, the maximum distance that we could uh, reliably uh, simulate and also uh, basically you know, gather very accurate post labels from Tron is about 10 meters or less. So, SPMV, so what that means is that in the images, the target is always like quite big. So we could just simply downscale the image um, and then feed that into our neural network. And that worked fine, um, but because we didn't do any sort of cropping, these large input means it makes, it's, uh, it takes a lot longer um, to train and also to do prediction. So we need to fix that with SPMV3. Uh, second thing is that it needs to be conducive to ODR, and in terms of the neural network architecture, the only constraint that it really imposes is that it should not have any of uh, the so-called batch normalization layers. The batch normal layers are a very integral part of the convolutional neural network architecture, and what that basically does is it normalizes the, the feature uh, within the neural network, uh, basically using some sort of statistics. Generally, these statistics are something that is approximated from the, the, from the training data set that is meant to really approximate the entire domain of the distribution of the training data set. So why not batch normal layer? Well, that's because when we do this refinement, we want to do this on every the sequence of images that are coming in. So we want to do it on one image, and then when the next one comes in, we want to do it there. We don't want to have to wait for long enough to have like enough batch of the training data, training data to do this refinement. Also, batch norm, when training on synthetic images, are really learning the statistics of the features for synthetic images. That does not really translate well to you know the space one domain or any other types of domains. So we want to get rid of this, and we want to get rid of any of the dependency on the feed on like a batch of samples. Uh, yeah. So as I said, with the uh, camel filter integration and the refinement of the SPMV3, this is something that we want to get rid of. Third one is that um, it must run on limited computational environment. So we have actually we could actually identify a couple of the scenarios here. So in terms of in-house testing, we have some tools that are available. So we have the Tyvek Plasset, which has the 800 megahertz flight processor. We also recently acquired the NVIDIA Justin Nanos. Um, this is the NVIDIA's more of an edge GPU device. Nano is like the most restricted one of the family of these. Uh, that we could use to try and see how well our model runs. In terms of the uh, orbital prime, 
Tamil has recently gave us the specs of the RPO Kit uh, processor that they plan to use. And that is also the <coughs> NVIDIA SOC. Um, so it is going to include the GPUs and also very old um, ar architecture of the NVIDIA GPU as well. So this is something that we can assume that we will have. Um, so if we need to do any sort of re retraining or like refining of the neural network on board, we could be using GPU as well. So it's a, uh, slightly more capable than the one that we have acquired. So it's slightly more capable, but it's also an uh, older generation. So it's like one generation behind. Um, and with, so there is also that performance difference as well. But we're not that far in terms of how right. percent of it. Right. So we want, and overall, we want to do all of this while maintaining the robustness of SPMP2. Meaning, while we do when we do this, we don't want to have any worse performance on the Speed Plus, uh, Lightbox, and Sun of images, and also some of the space for images that we have. So, how will we tackle this problem? For working on full range of distance of for resolved target, this is actually pretty simple. We just go back to what we did initially before SPMV2, and that is simply cropping, um, and this is the method that uh, TJ's team has adopted for the competition as well. When the target is that small, you don't want to just downsize it and then feed it to CNN because you will lose all these important features of the target. So what you do is you crop it. Now before we use a separate um, neural network to do the detection of the object and they use that to crop. But in this um, overall scenario of approaching from far range to close range, we can actually assume that we will have pretty good uh, reliable estimation of the target's 3D position. So given that information plus the available availability of the 3D model, which means the scale of the target, we could actually just crop this image without actually using a separate neural network. You mean from angle loading navigation? Right. Uh, so actually what we'll be focusing on is making sure that that assumption is valid um, with all that gray area. Uh, of course, we're going to have to keep a separate object detection network just in case there is a failure mode. But you know, if everything goes well, we could do this cropping for free, basically. Now, in terms of getting rid of the bachelor layer, so this was identified within SPMv2. So what we've done was replacing that bachelor layers with a normalized normalization layer that does not depend on the um, batch-wise statistics. And one example is group, what is called group normalization. I won't go into too much detail, but what happened when we switched that normalization layer was that first, the network with group, group normal layer uh, was more expensive to train. It actually incurred more memories, such that with batch norm, for example, we could train this on our desktop GPU, but with group norm, like the memory required, the required memory for training, like, I think like increased by like more than 50%. So this was not great in terms of like training it fast. We had to use Sherlock, um, which has its own problem. Um, also, we've seen, interestingly enough, loss of robustness on out of, domain, out of distribution domains. This is a little iffy because on some literature, empirically, you know, they would argue that you know when you get rid of the batch node, it actually helps the robustness on this out of domain distribution. Um, the out of distribution domains, but what we've seen is that that's not really the case here. Um, and also, normalization layers are, by nature, very computationally heavy layers. And this was identified by M NVIDIA back in 2017 with ResNet 50, that national layers, in terms of the learnable parameters, only <coughs> occupy less than 1% of the entire weights in ResNet 50, but it still takes about a quarter of the time processing that <coughs> layers um, when training the ResNet 50. And over the time, you know, arguably the linear operations like convolution has been more and more optimized on GPU. So do you can actually, we can actually say that that 25% has probably increased at this point. So what's probably better is let's just get rid of this altogether. And there is actually um, a normalization-free architecture called NFNet. But what's interesting is that for SPM v2, we have used this uh, efficient net v3 as our backbone, which, but NFNet, even the smallest configuration, has six times more um, 
learnable parameters. But what you actually see is that it takes half of the time to train this thing in terms of the time it takes to do forward propagation and back propagation. So if we can have used this when we have same amount of like memory of the tar of the neural network, what this is saying is that by simply getting rid of those normalization layers, that's going to um, basically give us a lot of boost in the computational speed. And also to mention the memory associated with the training of uh, the network as well. So now, the fact that NFNet has uh, 72 million parameters is a bit of a problem because when you save this model, that thing is about like close to 300 megabytes, uh, which could be a problem. Uh, we definitely want to decrease the memory footprint. So, and before moving on, I will say that it is possible to take the components of normal, that enables normalization-free architecture and then apply that to a smaller network. But my preference as of now is starting with the NFNet just so that we can use those uh, pre-trained models that are available. So the models that are pre-trained on a much larger data set such as ImageNet um, has actually shown to... Can you retain on the multi-head, multi-tasking? Uh, yeah, I will get to that part later. Uh, so we want to leverage that image that pre-trained uh, models um, and use that as our starting point for the training, uh, which has shown in multiple literature to actually contribute to the robustness across uh, domain gap. So that's why we'll start there, but instead we're going to try pruning it. Uh, so what I mean by pruning, um, there are actually two ways of pruning neural networks. Um, one is called the unstructured pruning. And what that does is basically it looks at all the weights and it's going to prune out the weights with the smallest magnitude. So it's basically a zeroing out those that you're not going to use those weights at all. Whereas structure pruning is going to work more in the filter or channel or even layer level. So graphically, this is what it looks like. So for these convolution kernels that you see on the left side with unstructured pruning, you see that there's a lot of holes that have been masked out um, because they are deemed insignificant um, because of, because they're very small magnitude. Whereas for structure filter pruning, uh, pruning is basically getting rid of everything in the filter levels. So the unstructured pruning is probably the easiest to implement, but when it comes to actually decreasing that memory footprint, this is actually the more difficult one because this creates a very sparse um, weights. And as of now, a lot of the uh, Actually, all pretty much all of the major deep learning frameworks do not support um, reducing, like basically getting rid of this and like sparsifying it to you know contribute to like smaller memory footprint. Whereas this, this basically means you just change the definition of that layer. You know, you have you're going to have different numbers of filters, like three by three filters, for example, and that's very easy to change here. But this one is more difficult to implement because when you get rid of a filter on one layer, that affects the definition of the next layer. And if your architecture is very complex with all different like connections going from like previous layers, like in the before to the after, like making sure that everything remains consistent is a challenge um, on its own. So we'll look into this. Um, but after that, what you can additionally do is called quantization. So Instead of using the single precision float values as your weights, um, basically you can reduce it down to 8 bits integer, for example, and that would also um, enable a lot faster computation. Of course, there's a lot of uh, overhead going on in terms of making sure that you this is done without loss of accuracy, loss of performance. Um, I wouldn't go too much into detail, but that is our plan with the SPMV3 in terms of making sure that it runs on the satellite avionics. Now, at this point, you might be asking, well, instead of large, well, apart from the whole issue of image net pre-trained model, why can we not just prune it first and then use that, and then just train that model from scratch? Because that will mean a lot faster training. So I'm going to touch briefly on the literature on you know, what's, what we know about these. So in terms of the unstructured pruning, the most prominent framework on this is named Laurie-Ticket hypothesis. And why is that? The hypothesis states that 
these very large, dense, randomly initialized neural networks, they actually contain a much smaller subnetworks that can match the performance of the original much larger one, but only if they are trained from the same initialization. So what this, what this is saying is that if you want to train that small network from scratch and then have it match the performance of a much larger one, you need to find that right initialization. And finding the right initialization is akin to basically winning a lottery. So that's why they turned it that. And that subnetwork that achieves that uh, performance is like, termed winning tickets uh, in multiple literature at this point. And this was originally hypothesized from empirical evidence, but this has also been validated theoretically. The existence of these winning tickets have been validated theoretically in multiple literature. And not only does it match the performance of the same task on the same, from the same training routine of the larger one, but when you transfer that um, same winning ticket to a different task, so if this works on the image net, when you transfer that smaller prune network to, for example, object detection and train it using different optimizer, they can also achieve the same level of performance that the bigger network would have achieved. So what this actually means is that this initialization is very important and this includes some inductive bias that is also data set and optimization free, optimizer free. So this is a very, in my opinion, very interesting observation, the importance of the initialization of the neural network. There's a stronger version, but I'm seeing that I'm getting, this is getting over, so I'm not gonna go much into it. In summary. Yeah, something I like very much about yeah. this is the analogy parallelism with local versus global optimization, which is, uh, I think, a parallel in um, optimization theory. Mm -hmm. um, in the sense that the larger network allow, allow you to sample the complete search space. Um, that's something that a smaller network doesn't allow to do. So local right. optimization versus the global optimization. Yeah, and there's very intricate relationship with like the whole training dynamics that is determined by the size of the neural network. Um, a lot of things going on in the machine learning theory community to basically explain why this is happening. Um, so yeah, so this is also the reason why we're gonna try to train the larger network first and then try to prune it down. Um, structure pruning so far has been mostly shown to cause larger drop in neural network performance if pruned to a same level of sparsity as the unstructured pruning. Um, and there is not really a theoretical support for whether there are winning tickets that has structural sparsity, so at the filter level or channel level. But in, there has been some work on trying to you know, identify if those winning tickets exist at all, in which case will be a very good news for us because we can use that to actually cause the memory, decrease in the memory for print of the neural network. So that's the summary. Let me get straight to the preliminary ex experiments. So, um, the, the one question. Yeah. The, the, there's a topic uh, that we discussed that we both agreed was promising. And it was about the uh, providing preliminary uh, a priori information to the net. Yeah. And then trying to learn the delta rather than the absolute. Uh, that can come from a Moodle navigation or from a, from a is it something you are considering? Uh, I'm considering that in, when we get to the uh, online refinement part, because that's where it really shines, um, but it, well, I won't be discussing it here. So, starting with the baseline, so the problem with cropping the input image is that uh, there is, we, cannot no, we can no longer use those crop images to basically directly regress the position and orientation vector of the target. Um, orientation vector maybe with some loss of uh, accuracy, but position vector definitely will be difficult to figure out exactly where the target is just from the crop images. So that eliminates one prediction head of the SPMV2. So right now we're just going to use the heat map prediction and then, you, and then we output the pose through the EPMP algorithm um, in terms of the data allocation, I'm doing everything except texture randomization. Um, that is because the target image is could be as large as the image frame, but it could also occupy only like 20, like 30 like pixels. 
on one side. So uh, consistently applying texture and randomization offline has been a bit of a problem. So we're going to start with without that augmentation, which is of course going to lead to um, worse baseline performance. But our goal here is to prune it such that that behavior, that performance is not degraded further. So starting with the baseline, uh, using a large input size, if we switch it to the normalization-free architecture, we see similar performance on synthetic and light box. Sunlight performance is a bit crazy. Uh, the reason I think this is happening is because mesh normal layer in itself has a regularized, uh, regularizing effect. But by basically getting rid of it, we no, no longer have the additional regularization effect, which is probably why with sunlight images, which exhibit a larger domain gap uh, from synthetic, this might be having a problem here. But when we use the crop in image input, it kind of comes back to the, the same level of performance. Uh, what's interesting here is the uh, training and testing times per each iteration. So this is the on our desktop CPU. This is using our uh, desktop and video GPU that we have in the, in, in the lab. And basically what you see is that similar thing, um, using six times larger network, but without normalization layer, we see about the same level of training and testing time on both GPU and CPU. So that's a really good thing for us. Now, from the crop images, I was able to perform unstructured pruning down to 7.51% of sparsity. What that means is from 71 million, uh, million parameters, brought it all the way down to five million parameters with um, basically not that big of a loss in the performance. And of course, this is remember that this is a much weaker baseline. So potentially, with much stronger baseline, this level of uh, degradation of performance could be mitigated as well, potentially. So, what this what does this look like in terms of like doing this pruning iteratively? So, interesting thing is that I actually tried pruning all the way down to like one percent of the neural network, and at that point, we have less than one million parameters. You see that for synthetic images, the Degradation and the rotation error is, I'll say, negligible. But for Lightbox and Sunland, the performance is actually um, gets a lot worse after a certain point. So this um, really gives us the idea of how important the data set such as Speed Plus is for these kind of applications as well, because we can actually use the Speed Plus to basically say this is where we're up to where we're going to prune our neural network and. That's going to give us the idea of the loss of accuracy that we will suffer uh, from the domain gap. This, so at 7.5% sparsity, I've actually uh, plotted how much of each of the convolutional weights have been pruned at each layer. So that's from the very beginning of the neural network till the very end. And there are a couple of observations that we can make. One is that Earlier layers are important, and that's also um, corroborated in multiple literature as well. It seems we have some layers uh, which are actually used for the attention modules um, seem quite unnecessary. So this is something, some sort of improvement that we can make um, in terms of you know just getting rid of them from the network architecture overall. And this part, this part performs a fusion of features at different scales, um, so that you don't lose any of that information when the neural network inevitably has to down, um, you know, down sample its features uh, for more manageable computation. So what this is telling us is that feature fusion is a very important, um, and the neural network wants to keep that those weights as much as possible. Now, just for curiosity, what happens if you bring this down all the way to 1% sparsity? Uh, oh, one more thing is that maybe this information can be used for some sort of structural pruning, is something that I will look into um, this month. Yeah, curiosity, 1% sparsity. You see that, you know, it's pretty much the similar pattern, but, you know, those intermediate layers in the middle seems completely unnecessary. And that may be true for synthetic images, uh, which is in distribution, but for out of distribution performance, those intermediate layers are also necessary for us to maintain. And lower sparsity is more important. Yeah. So, all right, from those results, you also may be wondering, 
So does it mean that for our neural network to be robust to out of distribution samples, does it need to be large? And this, originally I planned this as a segue to go more into um, kind of background on the machine learning theory because I thought it would be beneficial for us to, you know, collectively as a lab, improve our knowledge of how the machine learning works like in theory side. But I realized that this is going way too long, so the TLDR version is, that's what we've seen, and even in 2023, um, there's no definitive answer on this, but there's still active research on machine learning theory. Um, I'm going to dedicate maybe another lab meeting for that like session. For now, I'll just leave it this meeting. <laughs> Basically, with the power of the data set and computation, we have seen a lot of interesting phenomena um, from the practice of machine learning. And machine learning theory is very, trying very hard to explain these, you know, dispute them or corroborate them. But this is where we are. So, in conclusion, yep, normalization free architecture, improcropping, all great. We can do unstructured pruning. That doesn't really lead to in, uh, immediate decrease in the memory footprint, but you know it still gives, an, uh, gives us the idea of how far we can print it down. So future prep plan. Obviously, we need stronger baseline. So instead of just heat map um, from the lessons learned from SVMV2, we want to include potentially other um, more relevant um, tasks as well. So that includes, of course, binary segmentation, but also prediction of the depth field of the target or we can also even do the prediction of the surface normal associated with the target. And these are all data that we can readily extract from our um, Unreal Engine uh, simulator, something we could not do with the OpenGL before. Um, and of course, stronger data augmentation as well. Got to need to see how these, unpro unpro these pruned unstructured weights can be converted into potential structural sparsity so that it leads to immediate reduction in the memory footprint. Also working on this C++ integration into the camel filter of these uh, neural networks as well in order to support the uh, fly software for the 10 model aerospace. And on the refinement of the entire CNN, uh, since we'll have GPU on board, that we'll have smaller network, presumably. Uh, last thing, for future plans for testing, of course, the Flaccid and Vita Justin, we're also considering purchasing a much smaller mock-up model, maybe like down to four or five times smaller than the original size. Stick it into a Tron and see, at least qualita qualitatively, how our SPMV3 works across the main gap at far distance. I don't know if the Tron's calibration will be ready by then to, have, to be able to extract some meaningful um, post labels, but at least qualitatively, by projecting the results of our post predictions, um, like a wireframe, to the image, we'll be able to at least quali qualitatively see how well it does across the gap. So that's our plan as well. So with that, I will end the presentation. Wow, that.